love the rain. It's good for your hair. Well, we're here to honor our fallen comrade, Harvey Milk, who uh, reigned supreme in this camera store that was behind us, which is now called the Skin Zone. You know he would love that. <laughs> Fifteen years ago, a bullet dipped in homophobia and anti-Semitism ripped Harvey from uh, our life. But you know, you can kill the man, but you can't kill the idea. And we're, yeah. we're more than honored to be here this evening. Uh, to honor his memory, his legacy, particularly, I know if he was here now, he right. would have a great deal of anger and amusement in terms of people like Lou Sheldon. There's a Yiddish, there's a Yiddish uh, myth, mythological figure called a Dybbuk, and a Dybbuk is someone who, when they die, decided to stick around their spirit and their soul and cause a, lo a lot of problems. And I think every time Lou Sheldon has a bad hair day, Harvey is right there behind him. <laughs> Lou Sheldon has a PhD, a Pentecostal hairdo. <laughs> Just teasing it for Jesus. <laughs> I, want to, uh, I want to give you some of the mechanics of, of this evening. We're going to have quite a few of uh, Harvey's old crony, crony saying a few words about him. And uh, we also uh, will be dedicating the plaque that's going to be right in front of this store. 15 years ago this morning, that's 15 years ago this morning, I was sitting in a deposition in the city attorney's conference room, which was one room separated from the room where George Moscone was getting shot by Dan White. We finished the deposition and I walked out of the conference room and I saw a lot of people down by George's private entrance and I thought it was just the swearing in of supervisor to be Horanzi or we thought to be Horanzi. But it wasn't. An aide in the city attorney's office said, did you hear what happened? I said, well, what? Horanzi's been sworn in. He said, no, Dan White shot the mayor and Harvey Milk. I said, come on, I've had a rough deposition. He said, would I joke? So I went over across the building to the supervisor's chambers, and there were senior police officers, captains and deputy chiefs, looking like they had just seen hell itself, and they were very shocked. There was a senior deputy district attorney with a badge on his coat, and I just walked in. And Diane Feinstein, who was the president of the board, who became, as you know, mayor, was, sitting, was standing at the end of the corridor between all these little offices, and she came down the corridor. And I'll never forget this, almost like a hostess. She, she said, John. And then I walked in and I saw Harvey's body and blood on the floor of his office. Well, that was 15 years ago this morning, and I've had 15 years to reflect upon that and reflect on the meaning. And some of you were in high school or grammar school at that time. What is the meaning of Harvey's death? The meaning of Harvey's death is the attempt by oppressors to suppress and wipe out your and my identity, and they never will. So Lou Sheldon's and the Pat Robertson's and the Innes's and the Lumpkins and all of those people can't preempt God. They can come as people have come throughout history in the name of God to oppress people, but they won't oppress us. As the police commissioner said, and I'm glad he said it and not I, we'll do whatever we need. We'll take, do, we'll take any means necessary to get our freedom. And if little people like Pat Robertson can't learn lessons from history, well then they'll have to learn it all over again. When you march tonight to City Hall where that awful event happened, you are affirming your identity. Don't ever forget it. Thank you. Attorney John Moore. John has held many gay men with their briefs. Our next, our next friend of Harvey's, uh, uh, you know, political activism takes on many, many uh, forms. And uh, our, our next uh, speaker was very close to Harvey and very, very uh, active in the uh, legalization of marijuana, which again was a very juicy issue here in San Francisco, Dennis Perot. Well, I know we're not here when Harvey was here, 
I just want to tell you what kind of guy he was. He's a guy that stood by you when times got tough. When I got busted for running a pot supermarket two blocks away, he stood by me. Two weeks before the election, on the front page of the Chronicle, he was asked to defend Dennis Perone selling pot. He goes, Dennis Perone was doing a community service. Everything that Dennis Perone did in San Francisco was right. And selling pot, we needed it. <laughs> you know, I know, I know Harvey when his hair was longer than mine. I want to talk about his hair for a second. Because I know everyone remembers short hair Harvey, but I remember long hair Harvey. Why do we grow our hair? We grew our hair because we are sick of the injustice in this society. We are sick of being pushed out of this society. And you know, Harvey, like all the hippies, we saw a better world. We came to San Francisco to make a more just society and a better world. And we're going to start right here. Harvey stood by me when I collected proud signatures to put an initiative on the ballot in 1978 to totally legalize marijuana. Harvey stood by me when I was going to trial, when the narc that shot me called me a motherfucking faggot and said he wished he had killed me. We won last faggot in San Francisco. And Harvey Bilk stood by me when I went to jail, and he encouraged me to run for office when I was in jail. And the night before he got elected, I got a letter in my cell from Harvey thanking me for the big win on Proposition W and encouraging me with guy got because I got 15,000 votes for a guy in jail you know he supported me uh, encouraged me to do it again you know they killed Harvey and it's not a day in my life that I don't think about Harvey and what could have been they killed Harvey but they did not kill our dreams for a better society and a better San Francisco hey thank you It was a night that belongs to all of you, whether you were whether you were there or whether you're 19 or whatever. And I remember about about 1981, the press started asking me, "How many years are you going to do this? Uh, do you think people will show up three, four, or five years after the fact?" And I I didn't have any doubt about it. And if any of you have any doubt about being here. 10, 15, 20 years from now, get over it. Because tonight is not just Harvey Milk's night, it's our night. It's a night that has defined this community and called us to hope and is gonna challenge us as long as any of us are alive to respond to Harvey's journey. I, I, I'm a teacher now and, and one thing we do is spend a lot of time trying to figure out what the word queer means. And for those of you who are young and think that we old timers don't know what it means, Harvey Milk was queer. Yes! If, if, Harvey Milk, if Harvey Milk had been straight, he would have been bright and accomplished and successful and charming and horny and all of the things that he was. But Harvey Milk was Harvey Milk because he was queer. And the thing that made him not just a great human being, but that made him our great human being, was that he knew what it meant to try hard. He knew what it meant to, to play their roles. He was an actor. He, was, he had done sales. He, he knew what it meant to try to be what other people want you to be, and he knew that it sucked. And he knew that you didn't discover yourself as a human being until you got over all of that crap and began to do it the queer way. Yes! And when he... When he wanted us to come out of the closet, it, it, it wasn't just run home and tell mommy and daddy. Um, as one of the many who did that, it, it really was a drag the first month or so, wasn't it? <laughs> but the, what he meant by that was to get over it. To get over the idea that you can be so nice and so smart and so good and so clever that the world will like you despite the fact that you're queer. That was not true then, it's not true now. That he understood when he said, come out of the closet, and when he said that, that, that he wanted the bullet that would kill in his life to break open every closet door, he wasn't just talking about telling mommy and daddy. He was talking about getting rid of all the protections and all the defenses and all the illusions and all of the lies and all of the hiddenness and all of the bullshit and building a life based on 
power and honesty and determination and taking care of one another and building a community that can stand up to anything. And had it not been for a lot of people hearing that message, we would not have been able to respond to the HIV epidemic with anything like the power and clarity that this community showed as that epidemic came to deal with us. Harvey was a part of our life. He's still a part of our life. Somebody once asked me, why do you run to the office so often? And I used to say, somewhere in Des Moines or San Antonio, there's a young gay person, 13, 14, who all of a sudden realizes that she or he is gay, know that if the parents find out, they'll be tossed out of the house. The classmates would taunt, the police would harass that child. The minister says the child is sinful, in a child with several options, staying in a closet, suicide, depression, and then one day that child might open a paper and say homosexual electives in San Francisco and there are two new options. The option is to go to California. <laughs> Stay in San Antonio and fight. We need hope. Two days after I was elected, I got a phone call. And the voice was quite young. But it wasn't from San Antonio or Des Moines. It was from Altoona, Pennsylvania. And the person said, thanks. And I said, what are you going to do? I'm going to stay here. And I know of a case because of the phone calls of a youngster in Richmond, Minnesota, whose parents want to commit him because he's gay. And I said, play a doctor, family doctor. He said, that's who suggested it. And I said, how old are you? He said, 17. I said, well, you're too young to run away from home because you can be sent back. But if you go to the major cities, they can't find you. So pack your bag and get. He said, I can't. He said, why not? He said, I'm handicapped. And you've got to let gay people so that that young child and the thousands and thousands like a child know that there's a better world, that there's hope for a better world. There's hope for a better tomorrow. Hope for a place to go if things get too tough at home. Without hope, not only gay, but those black, and the Asian, and the disabled, and the senior, the essence, the essence, without hope, the essence give up. I know that you cannot live on hope alone, but without it, Life is not worth living. And if you help elect some of your fellow sisters and brothers, it would be given a green light, not just to those young gay people, but it would be given a green light to all the disenfranchised. And you, and you, and you, you've got to give them hope. Thank you very much.